The first modern personality trait theorist was Gordon Allport. In the 1930s, Allport and his students searched through dictionaries to find words that describe personality. They started with 17,953 adjectives, but settled on 4,504 of them. Allport suggested that most of these traits were common traits, traits we all hold in common. Some might have a lot of a common trait, but others might only have a smidge. But Allport also proposed that people can have individual traits unique to them. His morphogenic approach combined individual uniqueness, ideographic traits, and group comparison traits, nomothetic traits. You can compare yourself to others on agreeable, friendly, and caring. Plus, you can have your own special nobody-in-the-world-is-like-me traits. Allport bridged the lots of traits and only a few traits debate by combining them. Following Allport's lead, Raymond Cattell reduced Allport's list further. Cattell removed uncommon words and those he thought redundant. He whittled it down to 171 traits. Still following Allport's lexical approach, personality can be described by dictionary words, Cattell added a statistical technique, factor analysis. He concluded there are only 16 traits. His personality test, the 16PF, 16 personality factors, is still in use today. Cattell's factors included affectia, outgoing versus reserved, ego strength, emotional volatility, parmia, adventurousness, and surgency, a sort of happy-sad distinction. Cattell wasn't the only one using factor analysis. Hans Eisnick used the statistical technique to reduce personality to two dimensions, neuroticism and introversion or extroversion. For Eisnick, personality was more a matter of temperament than character. He revived the humors of Hippocrates, but reformulated the four humors into two dimensions, extroversion and neuroticism. Extroversion is a reflection of your physiological makeup. He believed that your shy personality is the result of your brain being easily startled. Specifically, Eisnick targeted the ascending and reticular activating system and the reticular formation of the lower brainstem. Introverts, according to this view, don't have the safety mechanism that extroverts do. When trouble comes, an extrovert's brain becomes numb and zones out. This inhibition process protects the brain from trauma. In contrast, introverts feel all the impact of the traumatic event and are overwhelmed by it. Although nervous people aren't always neurotic, Eisnick believe that they are more susceptible to problems. Hence the tendency for people to have nervous disorders, nervous breakdowns, and nervous tics. This nervousness is the result of temperament, built in physiologically. Since the sympathetic nervous system causes arousal and emotional responsiveness, he hypothesized that people who scored high on his test of neuroticism had an underlying physiology that made them more likely to be excited by danger and stress. People who remain calm under stress have a sympathetic nervous system that is less responsive. The tendency was to believe personality is biologically based and not limited to the brain physiology. In the 1940s, William Sheldon proposed that personality and body types were linked. He categorized people as being endomorphic, soft and round, mesomorphic, muscular and rectangular, and ectomorphic, fragile and tall. According to this approach, soft and round folk were friendly and cuddly, but muscular mesomorphs were assertive and energetic. Ectomorphs might be thin and shy, but they were smart. Sheldon's theory was more phrenology than psychology, but you'll still encounter people following this line of reasoning. In about the same period of time, Henry Murray added to trait theory by hypothesizing two influences on people, needs and presses. Needs can be both processes and internal states, achievement, power, intimacy. Your need for intimacy pushes you toward people. Your need for achievement determines how hard you try to advance in your career. Just as hunger is a physiological need that pushes you to get food, psychological needs are internal pressures that compel action. Your behavior is not solely the result of your needs. The environment also impacts you. These environmental presses pressure you from the outside. You can be pressured by a press of danger or deprivation. Your environment might press you to be friendly or compliant. You might be impacted by a rejecting environment or one of loss or duty. Both the loss in your life and the birth of a child are presses. In some sense, you are trapped between internal drives and external presses. 
Murray's other major contribution to personality theory was the creation of the thematic apperception test, TAT. Although today it is widely used as a test of creativity, the TAT was designed to reveal latent needs, unexpressed needs. Composed of a series of magazine-sized cards, the test is a collection of abstract images on which a person can project their personality. You would be given a card and asked to describe what is going on now, what went on before, and what is going to happen in the future. Your stories will be written down verbatim, and later analyzed for themes. Murray, who was psychoanalyzed by Carl Jung, believed that these latent themes were the key to understanding how people really felt. The TAT was a key to understanding one's personality. The most recent trait theory is a multidimensional theory called the Big Five. It is a consensus theory, not the work of a single person. It is the culmination of work over three decades using factor analysis. The Big Five are not specific traits, but dimensions. They are often summarized in a mnemonic device, such as ocean or canoe. The letters stand for openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism. In the 1960s, the Air Force routinely gave Cattell's 16PF to its incoming officers. Two researchers, Toops and Crystal, analyzed these tests, looking for underlying factors. From their eight samples, they didn't look at all of the scores, they concluded that the number of personality factors could be reduced substantially from Cattell's 16. In six samples, they could reduce the number of factors to eight. In another sample, they found five factors. In the last sample, they identified 12 factors. Another researcher used undergraduates instead of Air Force personnel and found five factors. The students rated their peers on 20 of the variables Tubes and Crystal used, four of each of the five factors. Through factor analysis, he found five factors, which critics suggest is not surprising since he started with four examples of each of the five factors. In another study, 1,431 words were rated on the original five dimensions, resulting in 75 semantic clusters. These clusters were later used with other words, but again, five factors were found. Again, not a surprise to the critics. If you start with five clusters based on five dimensions, it's not surprising you end up with five dimensions. Another research team, McCray and Costa, began with a two-trait model, neuroticism and extroversion, but later added openness to experience. Still later, they added agreeableness and conscientiousness. In their personality test, each of five factors was composed of six subscales, or facets. So extroversion is really a combination of gregariousness, activity, assertiveness, warmth, positive emotions, and seeking excitement. And agreeableness is subdivided into trust, modesty, compliance, altruism, tender-mindedness, and straightforwardness. Jointly, this view of personality is called the Big Five. Although these factors are called dimensions and not traits, the interpretation is not greatly different. You are defined as being at a particular point on the scale of openness and will remain there. Some variation is allowed, but not large movements. Modern trait theories may not propose a connection to the stars or lunar cycles, but as with all trait theories, you are destined to be that trait. Free will has no part in the theory.